Um, I was checking my phone. I was, we use stream, so I'm on job this morning. And they are, so we're, we're up and going there. But uh, uh, a minute ago, they sang that song, I Know I'm Seated in Heavenly Places, and that's from a tune. Top. And uh, what uh, we, you guys know that song, Beulah Land? Sing that song. But every place that Beulah Land is, pull it out and put Christ alone in. And you can sing that song. It's a great song. Uh, turn over to Timothy chapter number 1. That's where... You know, I don't know. I don't know about you. That is bothering me. Okay. Um... The yesterday we did the things here about the the marriage seminar and so forth, and uh, I ask you about, um, if you're going to speed of light, would your headlights work? So this morning we're going to talk about the speed of darkness. Well, I got to let that one sink in, okay? Anyway. There was another one on this I was going to... Oh, yeah, hard work. Alex was talking about work. Hard work pays off in the future. Laziness, laziness pays off right now. <laughs> anyway, ba-boom. 2 Timothy chapter number 1, uh, verse number 7, if you will. And uh, this is my, uh, my um, text verse here is verse number 7. By the way, before we read that... I was talk, mentioned I drive a special ed, uh, uh, special needs school bus, and uh, on, on my bus I have a, uh, a young man who's blind, been blind from birth and so forth, and he comes, gets on the bus, he goes, hey, bus driver Rick, somebody's been, re- I've been reading a joke book. I looked at him, I said, Thomas, how do you read a joke book? He goes, oh no, I'm sorry, they're, they're reading it to me. So do you know why blind people don't like skydiving? Because it scares the C&I dog to death. Uh, now that's from him, okay? So anyway, I, I got to be good for one or two here every now and then, okay? But uh, if, if, if at first you don't succeed, skydiving is not for you, okay? <laughs> All right? So in, in other words, if at first you succeed... Uh, if at first you don't succeed, destroy all the evidence that you tried, you know. Anyway, Second Timothy 1, verse number 7, we'll do something here this morning. Uh, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. And really, I have two points this morning, and uh, based on uh, the assignment given, and that is the issue of the capacity of grace, um, the, the capacity of grace gives us to have a proper perspective on life and ministry, And in point two, and thus minister to the real life issues of life. And as we've been going this weekend and we've been talking about the issues and different things and different ideas and how the, the, the form is now going to have to be adjusted and changed as we go over th- this winter season and the cycles and stuff. By the way, that, the cycle information that was taught many, many moons ago over, you know, and, and I, we teach, I teach that every year to my folks, remind them where we're at, because you need to know the season that we're in, so we know how to minister to people when they come through the door, and Paul here, he talking to Timothy, and he get this, this, and, and Ted started with it, John talked about it, Alex talked about it, and really, the end of the verse, a sound mind is, is my, is, is really the easiest piece of the whole puzzle, because he's to a point with Timothy where, Timothy, I remember your, you, I, I'm, I call to remembrance that unfeigned faith in verse 5. I want you to remember your upbringing. I want you to, 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 be, to be reminded of where you're at and where you've come from. Because things aren't going very well for Timothy, are they? A little tears, a little tough, ministry's down. I was talking, I, 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 by the way, somebody said something about emailing, uh, Ray, or talking to Ray, and his answer be, well, you know the answer. I emailed Dad one time. I needed help. I was, you know, right in the middle of something with some folks, and I need help. And you know what his email back to me was? Welcome to the pastorate. Dad. Okay. I, and, the, and I'm looking for a second one with the verses to help, you know. And no, just get in there. Well, 
That's where Timothy is. Timothy's in that struggle. Timothy's in it. And Paul just comes in and reminds him and says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance, verse 6, that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And we've been looking at that verse. And my, my section of the verse is the end of a sound mind. And it's interesting where Paul takes Timothy back in his thinking. If you look at verse 13. And we're going to move off of verse 13 here because there's an issue here about soundness. A definition of soundness, a free from injury or disease, firm, stable, good condition, good health. Folks, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but He's given us a spirit of what? Sound mind, free of disease. Free, good health, firm, stable. And Paul in verse 13 now looks and says, Hold fast the form of what? Sound what? Words. Wow, sound words. Timothy, remember, you've got a mindset. God, God has given you a mindset, a thinking process on how to think about things and look at things and do ministry that is free. Have you ever read a book? And you spit out the, the bones and you keep the meat and you got to decipher down through and some guy's saying this and you go, okay, I can't use that and I got this. Paul says to Timothy, through the Holy, the Holy Spirit, through Paul to Timothy, you don't have that problem. Now look at what the rest of verse 13 says. Which thou hast heard of who? Me. In faith and love, which is where? In Christ Jesus. Folks, what's going to get you out of the mire of the day isn't going to be you doing something in the energy of your own flesh. It's going to be who you are in Christ when you take the Word of God and apply that to the details of life. Now, I just said a mouthful, didn't I? Some of you got it. Some of you didn't think about it. Some of you go, oh, I've never heard that, and you're writing it down. You've got to pay attention now because in ministry, we, we come into ministry and we lay in the sound words, don't we? And we do it from the Apostle Paul. Come over to chapter 1 of 1 Timothy. I just This issue about soundness and the capacity that grace gives us to have the proper thinking about life and ministry. And it comes from a form of sound words. Chapter 1 and verse 16, you know exactly where I'm going, I hope. If not, we'll get there. He, he says, and i got to get there. Hang on. Pages stick together. Somebody asked me if I'm nervous. I said, I'm always nervous. The moment you're not nervous, you might as well get down and stop doing. <laughs> so the sticky on the hands and the sticky on the pages, and they stick together. Plus, my Bible's an Arizona Bible. It's used to dry heat, not moisture. Okay? So it, it's, it's very touchy. I have to love her very much. <laughs> it's, uh, first, first Timothy 1 Timothy 1.16, Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first... Jesus Christ might show forth all on suffering for a what? A pa- that's that form of sound words. Here's a pattern that's been established. And we see that being established in the life and the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Paul says in Titus 2, he says, Speak the things that are of what? 2-1, sorry. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Sound, firm, stable, free of disease, free of contamination, in good health, in good condition. And where do we get that from? Well, we're over here reading this book. We're doing this. We're doing that. We're trying all these things. And Paul says, no, 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 no. Timothy, wait a minute. Insert your name instead of Timothy. Wait a minute. I've already laid the pattern down for you. I've already come along and said, hey, This is where you need to be. Come over to Philippians 4. We understand this, folks. And and I'm not trying to repeat stuff you know, but I'm trying to get somewhere, so we got to lay this down. By the way, if you're struggling and having uh, turmoil and stuff in life right now, don't worry. Moses was a basket case once too. Okay? And you'll be okay. It'll work out if you do what? You got the Moses, the basket, and the water, and the reeds. Okay. It's bad when you got to explain them. Okay, but see, the thing is, is when you when you get into it, where do you go? Philippians four, verse number nine. 
Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in who? Me, Paul. Don't you think in 2 Timothy, Paul's getting to the near to the end of his life and he sees Timothy struggling, that it broke his heart. That Paul would have loved to have been able to get out of the bonds of the moment in the prison, in the deepest of prisons, and run to the rescue with Timothy. But he can't. So what is, he sends a better thing, doesn't he? He sends a reminder and a letter and an epistle in the Word of God that says, Timothy, remember that God gave you a sound mind. And you learn that sound mind from a form of sound words, a pattern, things that you've seen and learned and received and heard and me, and the end of verse 9, the God of what? Peace shall be with you. You want the God of peace to be with you? You want peace in your life? You want peace in the struggle? You know where you're going to get it from? Not old old Oprah. You're not going to get it from that. You're going to get it from where? The God of peace. And Paul says, you want to... Timothy, remember who you are. Remember where you came from. Remember, come back, flip back to 2 Timothy 3. And I'm going quicker than I had planned just because of the time. 2 Timothy 3. What does Paul say? You've seen, received, learned, seen in me. What did he do for him? 2 Timothy 3 verse 10. But thou hast fully known my what? My doctrine. Now what's the next three words? Manner of life. It's interesting to me that he doesn't say you know my life. He says you've known my doctrine. Then you've known my life. What drove the life? The doctrine did. What this firm foundation that the Lord gave to Paul, gave to you and I. It's interesting, he says to the Corinthians, though you have 10,000 instructors yet, I begot you. I hope you realize, I know somebody gave you the gospel and you heard the gospel and you got saved and you're sitting here today. But you are really a product of Paul's ministry when you chase it back through. And just as in Grace School of the Bible and just as in your local ministries, the ministry is on the line with you, Paul's ministry is on the line with you as well. Something to think about. You got a soundness. You got a, you got a thinking. Acts chapter 20. Actually, you're in 2 Timothy there, right? Look at, uh, well, Acts 20. Acts chapter 20. As you're going there, I, this was a. Anyway, Acts 20, verse 20. He's dealing with the Ephesians elder, the elders there at Ephesus. And he's instructing them, getting them prepared for him leaving. Verse number 20. Verse 19, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which, being, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I, what? Kept back. Kept back. How much? Nothing. Nothing. But notice what he kept back. What he did not keep back, sorry. That which was what? Profitable unto you. I read that, you know, I go, okay, what'd you keep back? If you did, if you let every, all the profit come out, what did you keep back? Well, what's going on in verse 19, at the end of verse 19? The Jews are trying to kill him. Do you think if he'd have went into the, the elders there at Ephesus when he met with them and said, you know, and started wailing on about all this and that, what would it have done to them? But rather, in 2 Corinthians 1, he looks over there and he says to him, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble in Asia. Now he brings it up. And he begins to pull it in. Why? Because in the moment, what did they need to hear? The prophet. Down in Acts 20, verse 30. I've left it. Hang on just a second. Acts 20 there. Verse number 32, and he says, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up. That was his goal there. He's building them up. And when folks, when we do ministry and we teach and we preach and we lay in the doctrine, we have to be laying in the sound doctrine. We have a capacity given to us in the doctrine. Come over to Romans 16. Romans 16. Verse 25 and 26. This should not be new to you. You should know these verses, right? They're memory verses in manuscript evidence, by the way. 
When we lay in the doctrine, we are laying in the sound doctrine, information that is designed for the good health, free of disease, free, stable, firm. And when we lay that in, the design is for then over in the life, you've known my doctrine and my manner of life. In life now, what are you going to do? Reach over into the doctrine and bring that stuff in and then go and live. I'll ask you, think about something. You're in Romans 16, 25. I'll ask you in just a second. Now to him that is of power to establish you. You go back to chapter 1, verse 11. He says, I'm going to give you some doctrine that's going to establish with the E. Establish, set it up. Establish, it's done. The concrete is cured. We can now build on this foundation that I've laid, which no man has laid. And that foundation is the life of Jesus Christ in time in the body of Christ. And as he lays the foundation, what does he say? He says, now to him there's a power to establish you according to my gospel. And we set up that clear presentation of the gospel, don't we? And now we got another setup. The preaching of Jesus Christ, which is by... The preaching of Jesus Christ, according to... I, is that which by? No, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. So now we've got a gospel that we can believe, and now we've got a message that we can function in, don't we? But there's another and, isn't there? And the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of the faith. Now the scriptures of the prophets, that's when everybody goes, hold the phone. What is that? Well, we can have that conversation another time. But when you think about what is Paul doing in Romans 16, 25, and 26, he's laying in the edification process, isn't he? To lay in the sound doctrine, to lay in the good concrete, to lay in the good foundation to where now we can go and we can have a proper perspective on life through the capacity of, of, that grace gives us. So we, we got a gospel. We understand. It's clear. Isn't it simple? That verse in 2 Corinthians 11, the simplicity that's in Christ. Do you know who makes that stuff hard? We do. It's simple. Have, would you have ever thought in your wildest imaginations to ask God to send His Son to die for your sins? No, rather, what do we say? Give me something to do. Do, do, do. The problem is, is he said, or not the problem, the thing is, he says, you can't do it. Oh, that is a problem. So I'm going to do it for you. Here it is, clear gospel. Then he says, now you got a gospel, justification, side A of Calvary. You flip over to side B, now we're going to talk about your walk. And sanctification. Remember the four pillars in Romans? What are we doing here? We're laying in information, aren't we? We're laying in doctrine. Paul to Timothy, Timothy, remember the doctrine. Remember the soundness of it. Remember the good health of it. Remember to not trust and relax in yourself, but to trust and relax in who you are in Christ. And he looks here in Romans 16, and what do we teach and preach? We teach and preach that all the time, don't we? The life of Christ and the grace life. And we begin to move that in, don't we? Come over with me to 1 Timothy 4 and get Titus chapter number 2. 1 Timothy 4 and Titus chapter number 2. I mentioned yesterday that I've been thinking about some of this stuff. We were talking about the marriage seminar and different things on... We do a good job of laying that foundation in to people. And sometimes we don't do such a good job as showing how that works out in life. And I sold, I, I examined myself. <laughs> I took heed of me, you know, the exhortation the other night. And, and 1 Timothy chapter number 4, verse number 12 Kind of came up and smacked, you know what the denozo slap is? Okay, that's what it did to me. Let no man despise thy youth, here it is, but be thou an example of the believers. Oh, ouch. 
But now what's the next word? In. Stop right there. How do I be, as a leader, Southwest Bible Fellowship, I'm the, I am the pastor. By the way, I know you guys like to talk about bishops and everything. In my neighborhood, if you call me Bishop Rick, they'll think I'm Mormon, so we don't use the term. Like it or not, we just don't, because what, I can't get through the front door. How you doing? I'm Bishop Rick. I'm serious. It don't work. By the way, I'm Bishop Rick. I'm in Acts. I don't know where you're at, but I'm there in the book, okay? Anyway, what am I to be? I'm to be an example of the believer, but where? In word. In what? Ah, there's that question I asked. What does a conversation look like? In charity. There's Alex. Charity, love, the labor of love. In spirit, in faith, in purity. Man, you're talking about a Denozo slab. Oh, wham. I'm like, oh my goodness. Because I'm sitting over here trying to figure out how to help my folks. And we've laid in the doctrine. They understand the edification process. They can quote the verses back to me. But there's something just not quite there. Because they struggle. Paul looks at Timothy and says, remember the unfeigned faith. Stir it up, Tim. Why? Well, I'm 1 Timothy 4. Because, Timothy, you're an example of what? Of the believers in word. So where should my words be? They should, they should be in the lifting up, right? Grace and salt and the truth and helpful in my conversation. I think, I think about that. I go, Wow. Conversation. Look at, hold on to Timothy. Look at Titus 2. Look at verse number 10. Well, that's not the verse. Yeah, it is. Titus 2.10. Not prolonging, but showing all good fidelity, that they may, what? Adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior in all things. Adorn. Get dressed. Put up, make it look good. As a leader, as someone who's putting in the doctrine, as someone who's pushing the, the issues and making the statements and building up and, and, and working and, and instilling the edification process, I've got an edict to me in 1 Timothy 4 that if you're in the ministry now, you kind of understand it, and if you're thinking about it, you better run. Because you know what happens now is because now you have to do what I've kind of termed as count the cost about doing ministry. Because when you become a conversation and word and conversation and charity, you know what that begins to do? That the doctrine, and by the way, this is all motivated by who you are in Christ and the grace and the message and everything, okay? But that thing begins to work in you where now you can't go do something you like to do. I'm a sports junkie. You name it, and I'll go watch it, and I'll go play it. I might not be the fastest guy anymore, but I enjoy it. I enjoy my motorcycle. I enjoy the quads. I enjoy the boats. I, it, but you know what happens? I don't get to do it very often. Oh, poor Rick. Don't, oh, poor me. I made a decision to do this. So guess what i got to cut out? That over there. Now, I do. we get to go every now and then, okay? More then than now, <laughs> okay? But the thing is, is you've got to think about that. Because as we're laying in that sound doctrine, the grace, the capacity of grace that's given to us, gives us a proper perspective on life, doesn't it? When you die, and you go to heaven... Absent from the body, present with the Lord. And the Lord blows the trump, and the shout happens, and our gathering together in the heavenly places takes place. You stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you're introduced to the God the Father, and the God the Father looks at you and says, Well done, my son. Welcome. And He lays you out into heavenly places out there. What do you take with you at the rapture? What do you take with you? Don't say nothing. Because you take something. You take your soul and the amount of doctrine that you've built up into your inner man, don't you? 
So as we strive and push and teach and lay that doctrine in, it has an eternal impact, doesn't it? But it's designed to have an eternal impact right now. Get a, get a verse with you. Get Ephesians 1. We've got to get the Philip Philemon here. But I, Ephesians 1 and verse number 21. A couple years ago, the last time I was here, we did a thing. I was doing a thing about the reward and the inheritance and all and stuff. And I've been working on that, teaching it at home. And, and, and uh, I have a great group of guys who are not yes men. They, boy, they'll skin you alive and then hand you back your skin and skin you again, you know, and, and which is a great thing. And it was an interesting thing. I was reading Ephesians 1, 20, 21. Far above uh, ver- verse 20 there, which he wrought in Christ, talking about his exceeding mighty power, uh, when he ra- uh, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. All those governmental structures, right? But now read the next phrase. Not only where? In this world. In this world but also into that which is... To come. See, what happens in that verse is we run to the to come, don't we? And we miss that that power that He demonstrated at Calvary and demonstrated when He set Him up is designed to work right now in time, in this world. See that? And you're talking about going, oh, wow. Because all of a sudden now, what do I, what am I, I, we, you know, we're talking about heaven and boy, that's a great hope and it's great to show people that and they get it, they get excited about it. But then over here, they're struggling, aren't they? <laughs> and it's like, well, wait a minute, let's bring that into this. So we go down through it. Now go to Philemon with me because time's running. My point is, is when we teach the doctrine, we're to be that example. We're to adorn the doctrine. We are, we're, we, gentlemen and folks in ministry, you ought to be watching what you say. Now let me say that again. You that are ambassadors for Christ need to be careful. We are designed to adorn the doctrine. By the way, I said ambassadors in Christ because that's you ladies too. Okay? It's everybody. And we are to put on that example of the believer in word and deed, conversation, so that when the lost world out there, that song we sang, can do what? Can see Christ... In me and in you. In thinking about this, so we we lay in the doctrine, we study the doctrine. It's important. It's critical. It's it's the life giving source. But we also need to be able to move to where folks are. And I struggled with okay, I I, I don't struggle too much. But I struggled with how do you, how do you make what does this look like? When I look at you and I say, stop sinning, to stop sinning, it's easy. Just stop. I had a guy, I said that one time, preaching at home. And he said, Rick, what does that look like? I go, that's a great question. What do you mean, what does it look like? So we go over to Galatians 5 and we run the list. We go to Colossians, we run the list. He goes, great, but what does it look like? I was like, hmm, there's something I'm not communicating here, <laughs> you know? So it got to me to thinking. So now when I begin to think about stuff, I ask, what does it look like? What does a conversation look like? What's it supposed to maintain? When you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, do you give an account of your neighbor or of who? You. What, it, what does that look like? By the way, you think about your conversations that you have with your spouse. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Roman, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33, the greatest, two, the greatest needs that a spouse needs for a wife is to be loved and for a husband is to be respected. Reverence is the word. You do those two things. You do that for your spouse as unto the Lord. That's what it looks like, by the way. Ooh. I got to reading through Paul's epistles, looking for, very specific, what does this stu- stuff look like in, the, in flesh and bones? And it's interesting, at the end of several of Paul's epistles, he does do that. He will tell you what this looks like in life. And he'll use himself or Timothy or Titus. But he uses Philemon. Now go to Philemon. We're just going to spend the next 10 minutes looking at Philemon here. And because Philemon sits at the end of, at the, end of the thirteen. 
And there's no new doctrine in Philemon. There's nothing earth shattering. There's nothing about the my gospel and the, the mystery set and, and how we, by the way, the scripture of the prophets, how we all work together in the great plan of God the Father, Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, or all of that stuff. None of that is in or demonstrated or revealed in Philemon. You got Philemon? Get Colossians 3. Set you up here for a minute. Now, Philemon is a great guy. He is in, in, in the area there around the church at Colossae. Um, obviously, Paul has a very close relationship to him. He's had toward the end of, well, he, he, got, he had a letter written to him that was deemed to be scripture put in the book. That's a pretty important guy. You got Colossians 3. Look at verse 13. Just going to use a verse real quick. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also what? Ooh, that's one of those verses that you cannot argue with. You cannot say, I'm not going to do it, because that verse just told you to do something, didn't it? Now, you got that in your mind? I'll go to Philemon. Paul shows up. Paul writes Philemon, sends the letter with Onesimus. Now, you know Onesimus. Verse number 5. Just jump in. By the way, verse 1, verse 2 talks about Philemon's household and, and grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, verse 4, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord and toward all the saints, that the communication of thy faith may be effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Woo! Could you, wouldn't it be great if Paul said that of you? Effectually working in you. We got a verse, don't we? 1 Thessalonians 2.13, the word of God will work in them that what? It works effectually in them that believe. What's going on in Philemon? What's the, what's the record of Philemon here by Paul? The word's working in you. You're refreshing the saints. Man, the saints are happy to see you. Glad to see you. I miss a year, and some of you guys I've never met. Some of you, I wish I didn't meet, but some of you I'm okay with, and I'm, look, I'm looking at going, wait a minute, where, is this, you know, where are these guys? What's going on? You know? But you, what do you get? You get refreshed, don't you? Paul says, man, Philemon, when you're over there doing the work, man, you are, you're, you're a refresh, a breath of fresh air off of the dry desert coming around the corner. But there's something else going on with Philemon, isn't there? Because who's standing in front of him that just handed him this letter? Onesimus. Verse 8. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee, what? Unprofitable. Unprofitable. Now let's stop right there. Get the picture in your mind. Onesimus walks up the, the walkway. Knocks on the door. Philemon opens the door, and there stands a gentleman in front of him that is unprofitable to him. Onesimus is holding a letter from Paul to Philemon. One Philemon opens the letter, reads through the greeting and the salutations, and comes and he says, I beseech thee for my son, Onesimus. Philemon's a mature saint. He's got the doctrine in him. He's got the grounded down. He's, he's at work of the ministry. He's refreshing to the saints. And he reads verse 11. Now, do you think he needed to be reminded about Onesimus being unprofitable? Don't you know he's like, hey, honey, dial 911, we got him. He's right there. Where's my cell phone when I needed it, you know? 
But look at the rest of verse 11. But now, profitable to thee and to me. Something happened to Onesimus, didn't it? Philemon isn't aware of it. Philemon sees a guy standing in front of him, shaking, here, don't shoot, don't shoot, come in peace, here's a letter, read first, <laughs> we'll talk later. What do you think Philemon did when he read that? Verse 12, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels, whom I have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willing. Look at what Paul just did to him, to Philemon. Philemon, you're going to have to make a decision about Onesimus, and what I want you to decide on is the issue of forbearing and forgiving. Colossians 3.13. I need you to think about the doctrine, Philemon, that you have in you as you're now going to have to respond and deal with and work with Onesimus, who to me now is a benefit. I know back there in time past he wasn't to you. But now I need you to do something. I need you to man up and be who you are in Christ and reach in and grab the doctrine. Verse 15 for perhaps. I love that. Philemon, Paul looks at Philemon through the letter and says, you need to rethink how you've been thinking about Onesimus. You just think he ran away. You just think he went and just get out of town. But for perhaps maybe something else. He therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him what did we read in Romans 12 this morning with, with Alex? What are we to do to our enemy? Shoot him. No. We're to do what? We're to love him. We're to have some charity toward him. Philemon, I need you to practice Romans 12. Philemon, I need you to grab in there and get that doctrine and put it to work. Because this guy's profitable now. Ministry is profitable. Not now as a servant, but above a servant. What a great title Paul just bestows now on Onesimus. A brother beloved. We're on high ground here, aren't we? But what's going on with Philemon still? What does he have to do? The letter's clear, isn't it? If thou, verse 17, if thou count me therefore as a partner, receive him as my... Paul says you've got to change the way you're thinking about this guy, Onesimus. You've got to change how, your viewpoint. You've got to have the eyes of Paul. Look at him through Paul. Look at him through my eyes and who he is. He's a brother beloved now. You got that doctrine laid in you, that sound word, that good stuff with no disease, no, no negative. It's all good, baby. <laughs> if he had wronged thee or ought thee or oweth thee ought, verse 18, put that on mine account. What does Corinthians say? Though I be loved, the less spend and spend me. Man, put his what he owes you. Now, this is an interesting thing here, because I don't think he's talking about money. I think he's talking about the emotional impact that Philemon went through in the forbearing and the forgiving of Onesimus as he left. He's wronged. Have you ever been wronged? How do you look at it? What do you do with it? If he had wronged thee. He's been wronged. Paul says, but now, man, he's coming back as a brother beloved. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it, albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, even thine own self beside. Paul pulls the old, you came from me, remember that. I begot you. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. You've been a refreshing to the saints. Refresh my bowels. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou would also do more than I 
say. Look at what Paul anticipates the outcome with Philemon and Onesimus to be. More than what I've written to you. Philemon, I'm looking for you to take the word that I instilled in you, that I laid in you, I put it in you, in this situation of of wrongness. Pull out the forbear and the forgive. We have a we have a kind of sometimes a warped idea about forgiveness. That says that verse says forgive as Christ also what? Forgave you. Does he hold a short account system in your forgiveness? Then why in the world do you do it with others? You're not to do that. You're to have the heart of the charity to look at them and go, I need to get the doctrine in them and I gotta fix this and we gotta have the we have to have that peace of God with us. To live peaceably with all men. Paul looks at Philemon and he says, I need you to do that. And I'm confident that you will do that, Philemon. You will reach in and grab the sound doctrine and the good condition and the lack of disease and the firm. And I I know you're going to put it in there. And I know you're going to look at Onesimus and you're going to hug him. And you're going to say, welcome back. And oh, by the way, we got to get over to Colossae. we got Bible study. Let's go. Now, take out Philemon and put your name there. Our dear Holy Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for the word, for the exhortation to maintain and to keep the sound doctrine so that the design of it is, will have the, desi- the desired effect in our lives so that everything that we say and do, we do it all to you heartily. And we do it for your honor and for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen.